Shalom. Welcome to The Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabad House of Dalmar, together with my co-host Mark Kroner to Statewide News Service and jbiztechvalley.com. Well, Rabbi, we have a, a first-time senator coming to our studio here, uh, Senator Mike Ranzenhofer from uh, the Buffalo area, yes, Amherst. Buffalo, yes. And uh, welcome to The Jewish View. It's so glad to, I'm so happy to have you here. Well, I'm honored to be here, and I uh, thank you for the invitation. Looking forward to it. Now, you have, uh, you're from Amherst? Amherst, New York, yes. That's where you're now. That's right. In, and you represent an area that goes like close to Bo Rochester, to Buffalo? Right. The uh, stretch of, uh, my stretch of district is basically from the city of Buffalo into the city of Rochester. So it's a very um, diverse district, <laughs> uh, long, narrow, um, long, narrow district, but uh, three different counties and, as I said, very, very diverse And you population. have Batavia in your district. Right, I have Batavia, you know, going from um, west to east, I have um, three towns, uh, Amherst, which is a town of about 125,000. Known, known for University of Buffalo. You're, it's the heart, right, University right. of Buffalo is about uh, three miles from my house. Right. I spent a lot of time there and two other smaller towns. Then I have Genesee County with, as you just mentioned, Batavia, and that has about 60,000. And then I go into the Rochester area and have um, about 70,000 residents in two towns there and 40,000 in the inner city of Rochester. So I have very, very urban area, very, very rural area, and very, very suburban area, which is very, it's a microcosm of the state, right. but it's very unusual for one district uh, to actually have three very distinct type well, of territories. I, I used to work with WBTA in okay. Batavia. Oh, okay. And I used to be their Albany guy. Okay. So when I, but when I went to visit, mm -hmm. well, I'm turning on the station and I'm hearing the traffic report. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, it's a one light city. <laughs> they have one traffic light here. Why do you have a traffic report for? Well, they have about 20 traffic lights, but. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. you know, so Compared you. Compared to New York City. <laughs> but yeah, you, it's but a fear. But the new station owner, Dan Fisher, he yeah, said Dan, to me, yeah, yeah. he says, well, because people live in Batavia and they either work in Buffalo or Rochester. Right. So we give them the throughway, uh, the, the, the traffic, right. But traffic it, right in between Rochester and Buffalo. And I just never thought of yeah. Batavia as being a, a, a bedroom community for Buffalo and Rochester. Yeah, there are a lot of people that I know that, I mean, if they, I mean, a lot of them, you know, work and live in Batavia in the Genesee County, but there are a lot of folks that commute back and forth to the Rochester area and to yeah. the Buffalo area. And they have uh, traffic reports. And they have traffic reports because you want to get there on time. So, you know, probably one though. of the biggest issues, I'm, you know, obviously, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, is probably the economy. That's what they always say, even in Albany, the upstate economy. Right. Yeah. That's what they say is so depressed. I mean, you see the Buffalo, the numbers have gone down in population, the economy. I mean, I drive through there. I really don't know that much about that area, but... Are you uh, working on certain things to help that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I would say the, you know the entire upstate region from maybe not Albany so much because there has been a little population growth, but if you just look at you know New York State um, nationally mm -hmm. um, and the power that we've lost in Washington, I mean mm -hmm. I think we went from a high of 49 representatives at one point. In uh, in the nation's capital, and now we have like 27. So we're really like that about, I didn't know that. yeah. Oh, so yeah. we're about you know, a little bit you know not quite 50 percent. But um, you know one of the things that happened. I mean, if you want to go back historically, if you remember the you know the the 1900 uh, Pan American Games yeah. and the expo, you know expo, exhibition, you know there were about 600,000 people in the city of Buffalo. That's and now it's about you know, it's about 250. Mm -hmm. So you know the surrounding suburban areas are doing well, like Amherst with the university. I mean that's a growing area, but you know all of upstate, um, you know over the last 60 years has been losing population. The most recent loss is probably due, you know, to the loss of steel manufacturing, rubber manufacturing, auto. I mean you know you had companies um, like uh, Bethlehem Steel, Republic Steel that would employ. You know, twenty-five to thirty thousand people. Really, that many? Yeah, mm -hmm. and now they have hundreds. So, and then you. Well, it's you, like GE and Schenectady, the same type of thing. You know? Right, and Syracuse and Kodak in right. Rochester and Syracuse. Carrier Corporation. Uh, Carrier Corporation, right. uh, Westinghouse. Um, you know, all of them. I mean, the manufacturing is down, or in other areas of the world yeah. or the country, and 
you know, as a result of that, uh, you know, population has really, really dropped significantly. Yeah, the other thing is that um, in, the, in the Senate, you have a, um, well, anyway, getting back about population, New York State just didn't lose population. They're not growing as fast as the other states. And, right. and just a uh, few years ago, a couple, maybe it was last year, we fell behind Florida. So now we're the fourth most populous state right. behind California, Texas, Florida, and then New York. Right, and most of the so, yeah, most of the population growth um, is in the New York City area. You know, the other areas are either losing population or holding their own. But it really is where you stand in relation to other states. So even with our you know, net positive gain of people, mm -hmm. um, you know, we still lost two representatives, which represents about you know, each district, each congressional district is about. Uh, three quarters of a million people, I think 770,000. So, you know, that's, you know, one plus, you know, one and a half million mm -hmm. people that were lost at least in the last 10 years in order for us to drop yeah. two. What do you think of um, the, did you ever think of a run for Congress? Did you ever? I never did. Um, I actually, when I first ran for the Senate, um, there was... How long ago was that? Um, seven years ago. It was 2008 when I first ran. And um, when, at the time that I ran, um, the senator was retiring. Mary Lou Rath. Mary Lou Rath, my predecessor. And there was also an opening in Congress. Um, so I thought about both of those opportunities. I thought about the congressional seat for about 20 seconds. And uh, it really wasn't the right fit for me. Um, you know, for many reasons, uh, one of them being that I had worked in county government and the reason I wanted to run for the state senate is so much of what happens in the county is governed by what happens in the state. And I really thought that my background and experience in county government would be, make me a good candidate and an appropriate candidate to serve in the state senate where there really is no linkage to what happens in Washington. What happens in Washington, a lot of national security issues, a lot of federal issues, immigration, uh, it really wasn't my area of expertise. So was was it when you say there was an opening of Congress? Was it Kathy Hochul or was it Chris Collins or which, I was neither. Which uh, seat was it? Um, it was the um, Tom Reynolds held the seat at the time and had decided not to seek re-election. Right. And okay. a gentleman by the name of Chris Lee, Chris Lee. ran okay. and he won. So, yeah. um, but in the Senate here in New York and Albany now. It's going to Republican, then Democrat, <clears throat> Republican. I mean, have you seen that both? I mean, you've been here for a good few years. Yeah, so you've been um, in that right. It was very bridge. unusual because um, you know before I was here, it had been Republican for about 40, seventy yeah, years, okay. with with the exception of maybe two years. So it always, yeah, yeah, always been Republican. And um, you know, I had served in uh, as a minority representative in the county legislature, so I was enticed to run for the Senate to become a member of the majority. Yeah, that's and that was the only um, open seat other than Senator Bruno's seat. He was retiring, but the person that was running for his seat, uh, it was really not a contested seat. I mean, it was a very easy race for that individual. So my seat was the only open seat. So it was really the focus of the state uh, was really focused on, on my seat. And they said, well, yeah, if you win, you know, you're going to be in the majority. So I win. And then there are two senators from Long Island who got knocked off, so I yeah. went to serve in the minority. But the last, um, you know, the last, so my first two years were in the minority, but um, the last four years and then these two years, you know, we've been in the majority and it's been a, you know, substantial you, you, difference. You chair the Corporations, Authorities, and Commissions Committee. Yes, right. Uh, what's going on with that committee that uh, you should tell us about that's exciting and interesting? Oh. And well, well, first of all, you know, you mentioned what's exciting and interesting. There are a lot of things that are exciting and interesting to me, but it probably is one of the driest committees, and you know, no one wants to serve on that committee uh, with the enthusiasm that I do. So okay. I'm the chair of that. I love serving on that committee because you really touch a lot of people's lives because um, you wouldn't, you'd be surprised, but when you sit down and think about it, you know, we govern what, what happens in the not-for-profit community, and for instance, you know, that's over, um, I believe, a million workers in the state and, you know, billions and billions of dollars, whether it be health care, you know, you know, hospitals. Um, so the not-for-profit really covers a very, uh, you know, wide brand. And we actually have had some tremendous uh, legislative um, achievements. Um, a couple of years ago, we um, enacted, um, you know, introduced and then actually got passed and signed into law the Not-for-Profit Revitalization Act, which Again, you know, it doesn't sound very 
exciting or sexy, but um, it really revised the not-for-profit laws for the first time in 40 years. And when I was introducing this bill, you know, other people had tried in the past and it never got anywhere because you were waiting for, you know, bar associations and law revisions to comment and lawyers just take forever mm -hmm. to do things. So, um, you know, we decided to have some public hearings around the state. People saw that we were serious. We had one in Albany right here. We had one in New York City. We had one in Rochester. Mm -hmm. and we got the law passed and uh, signed into law. And that was probably, you know, one of the greatest achievements, you know, for a you know, not very exciting topic, but one which really impacts people's um, lives. And um, the interesting thing is, is one of the things I saw this year is there was something that was put out in the local paper, City and State. It's a local paper yeah. that folks take a look at. And they and the question was which is the you know, which is the most which is the bill that gets looked at the most? So the number one bill that got looked at the most was the um, gay marriage bill, and that had about maybe twenty eight thousand hits. Uh, people were interested in that legislation. Then the second most looked at bill was the not for profit revitalization bill, which had. And I'm roughly estimating, I'm not sure if I remember exactly, but about 26,000, so right behind <laughs> a very, very hot topic. The third most looked at bill had like 6,000 hits. So, you know, when you see something like that, I mean, people in the community at large were very, very interested in that legislation. So I take a great deal of pride in, in, in serving as great. the chair of that committee, and well, we've, we've had a lot of... Uh, That's why I wanted successes. to touch on it yeah. because I didn't want to just, I, I personally know that you could do a lot with right. it, but most people, like you're saying, think it's a dry right. committee, so I was kind of right. being a little dry in my humor yeah. in terms of <laughs> <laughs> what's like new and exciting in this Yeah, uh, people committee. are really not rushing but. to serve on that committee, you know, it's like kind of a, you know, a groan, but... <laughs> You know, when, when the people that are on the committee get into it and start rolling up their sleeves, I mean, they see well, that there's the, really a lot of good work. Another in, committee that you're on is agriculture. Yes. And one of the measures that you were uh, almost as famous for was uh, the yogurt, uh, making yogurt a state snack. I, I thought you might remind me of that. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. What, what happened? With, I mean, then John Stewart lampooned the, yeah. the whole thing. and. <laughs> Well, you know, I'll give you a, try to give you a short history. Yeah, yeah, uh, what had happened is there's an elementary school in the heart of my district in Genesee County near Batavia called Byron Burgeon. It's a relatively small school district, yes, and uh, the kids in the fourth grade were studying um, state symbols from across the country, like New York state symbols and then state symbols of other states. And they were looking through this, and they saw that other states had a state snack. You know, like we have a state flower, we have a state... Um, um, bird, or bird. Yeah. we have, you know, we probably have about 70 or 80 state symbols. Mm -hmm. And they saw that other states had a state snack and we in New York did not. So, you know, with the encouragement of the teacher and the kids, you know, they said, well, you know, we should have a state snack. And they uh, came up with the idea of yogurt. Um, and it really fits into the theme of an agricultural community for two reasons. One is um, that in that community, uh, there are two uh, new yogurt uh, manufacturers that have opened up shop in the last year or two employ you know about 300 people um, and they're growing and one of the and one of the products that you need to make yogurt is milk and Genesee County and the counties around there are one of the largest uh, milk producing you know very big in dairy so they went on a campaign to try to get um, support and they wrote to me and they wrote to our assembly uh, member and they wrote to the governor and other senators. So I introduced the bill, and um, Senator uh, Hawley and McGee from the assembly also introduced the bill. And um, the assembly you know, didn't want to take it up after the no, they didn't thing. want to take it up after the con <laughs> after the big uh, debate. So uh, what happened is uh, you know it worked its way through committee, and it was really a non-controversial yeah. type of bill. Um, it was really a good a good example of you know because we talk in schools a lot about how a bill becomes a law. <laughs> And, you know, so these kids were actually living how a bill becomes a law. So they wrote us and they lobbied us and we went to the school and got a lot of support. And I got my colleagues to support it. So we got it through the Agricultural Committee. We got it onto the floor of the Senate. It was scheduled on the agenda for that particular day. And there was a political dispute between Republicans and Democrats where normally, you know, the bill would be talked about for maybe a couple of minutes and then it would pass unanimously. Yeah. But um, the other side was upset. Democrats. Uh, Democrats Bruce were Kruger, upset. Senator Kruger in particular. Senator Kruger and, and Senator Gustavo, Gustavo Rivera. Rivera. 
And, um, you know, they were asking, you know, what is a snack? And they were asking, what did you consider potato chips? And all, really, when you look at it, really ridiculous type of questions to try to make a point not, not to do with this bill. So we debated, you know, when you look back, you know, 45 minutes went by, yeah. and we were debating this bill, which would normally take a minute. Um, and I guess, you know, people thought, at, you know, after listening to the debate, you know, the questions, which I thought were silly and ridiculous, and my answers, which were, you know, which were serious answers, um, you know, it caught uh, David Letterman and John Stewart's John Daily Stewart, Show. And then that's when it went viral, and, and they took the clips out of it. Yes. And his ad libbing, yes. uh, making comments, it was probably one of the most hysterical skits that you'll ever see in well, your entire life. Well, one of the things life. that it says is it raises the issue of lactose intolerance. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was a Liz Kruger question. You know, she had concerns about that. And one of the things that. And you I, said lactose free soy yogurt. Yes, I, I actually, I, 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 I like to think that I was pretty knowledgeable and educated on and the subject. Funny. And funny, maybe. I'm <laughs> not gonna, I'll, funny. I'll leave that judgment to others, but knowledgeable I'll, I'll, I'll okay. take credit for. But it's interesting because my wife, um, at the time, was a vegan. You know, she did not have dairy and meat and stuff like that. So I was very familiar with, with the fact that they have soy yogurt. So I was able to answer her. I remember John Stewart made some comment, like, how does he know about this? And he <laughs> called me the Ken Jennings of, um, you know, of, 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 of yogurt. <laughs> Ken Jennings is probably the greatest winner on Jeopardy, like one yeah. of the smartest guys yeah. in the world. So I took that as a compliment. Yeah. That, uh, <laughs> you know, it was a compliment. But you know, he was making fun of my name in front of the whole, you know, they did a whole parody on it. It was really, you know, I was kind of, uh, you know, I, mean, I was he, on the receiving end of it, but it was really very, very funny. It he said, really basically funny. said, I'm telling you this may be the best 40 minutes any legislative chamber anywhere yeah. in the country has ever spent. <laughs> 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 so, you know, with yeah. all the other, I mean, we just went, you know, when you see these long debates that go on for hours and hours, and then all of a right. sudden you see something that you could just roll your eyes and think, yeah. oh, is this the best thing they could spend their time on? Yeah. You know, the Democrats come up with certain things just to dig you a little every once in a while. Yeah, that was, that was their inside. point. I mean, it was not a serious debate on their point. I mean... Yeah, they but made, anyway, you're on the yeah. Agriculture Committee. And I am on the Agriculture Committee. You served your constituents, and they were all happy. And, and we had the happiest group of fourth graders in the world it's because it. that's one thing they can never take away with, from them when they are my age and when they're parents. Right. I mean, they can tell their they can tell their own kids that you know this is what they did in the fourth grade and their so little class project. <laughs> you know, they, that made it through. It made it into a bill and became a law. So. I also I wanted to ask you about your. Um, Oh, uh, let's see, what other, com well, j just so everyone knows, I just wanted to sh share with everyone your, uh, your other education committee, you're on the finance committee, judiciary committee, racing, gaming, and wagering, which is, it takes under casinos. And right. Can, you and chair any besides that? No, you just, no you, one. every but, member chairs one committee. That's yeah. all you Yeah, yeah right. The, right. Uh, you're one of the, well, si Simcofeld is an anomaly of, of whether he's Democrat, Republican, whatever. Yeah. But you're the only Jewish Republican. I am. I am. Okay, right, right out in the same. Right. Steve Saland from the Hudson Valley used to be. It used to be the two of you. Well, and we he's had also, um, um, how quickly we forget. Yes. Um, what area? Um, Oh, Long Island. He just ran for Congress. Yeah, Lee Zeldin. Lee Zeldin. Okay. So we had a little minion. Right. Not quite a minion. We had a little <laughs> caucus of the three of us. That's right. Although I'm not sure if yeah. Steve and uh, Lee overlap, but no. you know, Steve <laughs> left about four years ago, and Lee just left uh, this Rest, year. Yeah. So yes, yeah. I'm the only Republican so, and Jewish so you, person. You, and do you? And then you have some Kofeld as a Democrat, but right. caucuses with the Republicans. Right. Do you commiserate with him? And maybe there's some of the religious stuff that rubs off on you. I'd that? say, well, he's much more religious than me. Because you're much me. more cultural. Yeah, we have a, we have a common bond, obviously. And uh, Simka is one of the funniest guys <laughs> around, and, a, and an excellent, excellent senator. You know, represents his district very well, very conscientious. And you know, also con very conscientious about his faith, mm -hmm. and um, you know, we're all very respectful of that. And well, I see more kosher food around the Senate Republican yeah. <laughs> lobby than I used to. So. Right, exactly. <laughs> so um, no, I get along with Simka very well, and um, as I said, you know, he's a source of inspiration for me. He's a very religious and very spiritual individual. Well, I'm just glad that they didn't seat you like together, where that's like the Jewish section. You know, it's no, like, no, we're we're, we're close to each other, but yeah, um, <laughs> no, and, and, and no, there's actually there is, you know, it's funny because. 
this, you know, there, I mean, there really are no sections, like there's no Long Island section or right. upstate section. You know, we all actually, you know, get, a, you know, get along uh, very well with each other, you know, no matter where we fr are from, no matter what our faith is. So, right. um, you know, I think I fit in pretty well with Simpka and everybody else. I wanted to ask you, you're an attorney. I am, yes. And there's a big uh, debate going on as to whether attorneys should disclose their clients. Right. Uh, can right. you fill in the audience about what's going on and then how you feel about it and your personal views on it? Sure. Um, you know, there's a movement afoot. Uh, there's many movements afoot. One is to, you know, for instance, people from, uh, to bar people from working outside the legislature. So you should just be a full-time legislator. There's a movement afoot to distinguish between full-time and part-time legislators where full-time legislators would be paid a different amount of money than part-time legislators. There's a movement afoot to have attorneys disclose their clients. And you know, you really have to strike a balance between the public's right to know and the privacy expectation that a client has. I mean, if someone is coming to me for a real estate transaction or an adoption or a divorce or a criminal matter or an injury case or, um, you know, no matter what the type of matter, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it really has no bearing on um, state, on government. state government. Right. You know, there is disclosure right now that, you know, we're banned from representing individuals or companies before government or, right. or state agencies or the state court of claims. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so that obviously has to be disclosed and you're not allowed to do it, so there really is nothing to disclose. But And, and does that put your partner, Mr. Friedman, under uh, the same rubric as you? Even yeah, it's for not an elected official? I right, mean? it's for law firms. So if you are a member of a law firm, and you know, we have a small law firm, we have three lawyers, and yeah. uh, you know, we have a pretty robust practice. We have a lot of clients. Eight offices, I think I read? Well, we have, um, I believe, website? six offices. Six? Okay. Um, well, that's robust. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say so. And, uh, you know, um, as I said, we have a good practice. But, you know, for someone who's coming out to us for estate matters or divorces right. or whatever the case may be, you know, I just don't see the relationship and, you know, why, you know, I mean, they have an expectation of privacy that if they come to me, you know, their name is not going to appear somewhere in a disclosure statement that I'm representing, uh, you know, Mrs. Jones or Mrs. Yeah. Goodman. Because even if it's sealed, you know how that glue just comes off that seal, you know, very, at the well, right it's, time, you know. Well, there's a question the, of... The paper pops out of the envelope on its own, you know. Yeah. Well, there's a question of whether or not, I mean, does, you know, is that something that the public no. should know that, you know, you're coming to me you know, because um, in you fact, know, I may not come to you if I know that there's a possibility that my name is going. So that would hurt your business. It would hurt my and business. And why should you have to be hurt? Well, and, you know, and it negatively impacted. Well, and under the like Constitution, that. I mean, you know, this is a part-time position. That's it's right. not a full-time yeah. position. I mean, and I, I want to keep it that way. I do. I mean, I subscribe to the philosophy. Right now, in in Congress, we have full-time congressmen, and we see how effective that's been. I mean, they don't get anything done. All they do is posture. And, uh, you know, it's very politicized. Um, you know, I think there's a good balance right now between people that, you know, work in the Senate and also have, um, you know, private businesses, whether it be in the law. Now, law, there are more lawyers than there are, for instance, dentists, because it's just a natural attraction that someone who is a lawyer is mm -hmm. going to become a lawmaker. But, you know, we have contractors and chiropractors and mm -hmm. real estate mm -hmm. uh, individuals. And, you know, to say that someone should not have a foot in the community and, um, you know, an understanding of what it's like to run a business, uh, you know, when you're going to be passing laws that affect business. I mean, I don't subscribe to that philosophy. I subscribe to the philosophy of, philosophy of a citizen legislator that, and it's not that you have to go back and plant the crops. I mean, that's not the theory anymore. But, you know, I think it's healthy to work in the community or even if you volunteer in the community. I think it's good to get out into the community and see how business works and see how community groups sure. work. So that's why I don't subscribe and do you, to that And philosophy. if there are ethics reforms for the state legislators, do you think they should be the same for the governor and the executive chamber? Well, it, it should, well, not only for the legislature and the executive, but also for the attorney general's office and the controller's office and people that work in agencies. I mean, there should be, but it's different types of disclosure. Like, for instance, you know, there are not a lot of 
um, private, you know, part-time attorneys that would work in agencies or work in the executive chamber because that's a full-time job. But you know, there are other issues with respect to you know people that are appointed to commissions and people that sit on boards and people that are awarded contracts, whether it be for social services or highway paving. You know, what is the connection between them and the governor uh, or them and the attorney general? Um, which actually people are more interested in than whether or not Mrs. Smith comes mm -hmm. to me for a divorce. Um, I mean, there's a lot more, you know, there's a lot more interaction and potential for abuse than there is, you know, by me not disclosing, you know, right. who's coming in for a will, that's who's right. coming in for and a real estate deal. And that's what you do a lot of estate and wills. Do we do a lot of estate and wills. Yeah. You know, we do a lot of representation of individuals and small business. I mean, we don't represent large companies. This is the time for your shameless plug. Well, <laughs> no, I'm not going to. I'm not going to take advantage of that okay. now. But, uh, we have a very, we have a very broad uh, base clientele. We do a lot of different things. All right. So. Uh, so you're on, like I mentioned earlier, you're on the racing, gaming, and wagering committee. Right. So with casinos, how did you come down on that? And uh, Tyre is sort of east of your, the you know, east of your. Uh, end of the district, eastern end of your district, it's further east. Well, it's out of my district, so it's actually, it's, it's east of my district. That's what I'm saying. Right. That's what I'm trying to say. Right, exactly. <laughs> and, I knew what you were talking about. So. And I'm just wondering, you know, still it'll have an impact on the eastern end of your district. Right. So how do you feel about gambling and casinos? Yeah, well, my feeling was, and I've dealt with this issue, um, you know, before, yeah. is, uh, you know, personally, I'm opposed to it. Okay? okay, I don't really think it helps communities. I think it really hurts, especially poor people. And you don't go up to Niagara Falls and um, I've been there. Sneak away. And I've been there once or twice. Uh, you know, and you know to see a show. Just to see, yeah. And you know, I'm, but you no know, roulette or anything. I might no never roulette. Okay. But my big, you know, my big gambling night would be to take out a twenty dollar bill <laughs> yeah. and do like the one arm bandit for about a half an hour until I get bored. <laughs> That's about me. And, yeah, <laughs> and maybe I'll end up with fourteen dollars. So I consider it, I consider it my inter Yay. my entertainment. Yeah, <laughs> but um, you know, I have a um, uh, a racetrack and a racino in my district in Batavia. Batavia Downs very important to oh, me. Yeah. So. I thought it was important to serve on that committee, but back to your point, you know, I'm not in favor of it, but I am a big um, fan of initiative and referendum to give voters uh, the choice of what they want. So that was actually put on the ballot, and you know, the electorate decided whether or not there should be casino gaming in New York State, and the mm -hmm. voters approved that. Right. So I believe in giving them a choice, even though my personal view is I don't like it, I'm not in favor of it. Um, I thought it was important to give voters the, uh, the and, right to decide. And that. going back to look at the southern tier to put one down there, I mean, is that fair? I mean, is that well, you know, fair? it's not for me to decide whether it's fair. I mean, I don't think it's going to really help their community. I mean, I'm looking at the, um, you know, in our area, we have one in, um, we have one, there's an, um, a Native American one in right. Salamanca, there's one in Buffalo, and there's one in Niagara Falls. Right. I mean, you know, they're beautiful facilities, but they have not helped the community. I right. mean, the community around it is not good. And then you look at other areas like Atlantic City, and you know, there are a lot of people getting out of the business because it really is not good. So, um, you know, the Southern Tier, uh, you know, would like one. You know, I believe in, um, you know, in communities being able to decide, you know, their future. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think it's necessarily good for them, but it's not for me to decide if they feel it's. Good for them. It's kind of like manifest destiny. If they feel that this is right. good for them and their destiny at the end of the day, then uh, it is you know, what it is. Huh? I, yeah, you know, I, you know, I would, you know, I would encourage the gaming association to, you know, consider their request and take a look at it. Okay. So we uh, just in the last few minutes that we have, you were given the Guardian of Small Business Award and several other Business Advocate of the Year right. award and stuff. I mean, how much of a, a you know, so you're. Prominent businessman. Everyone likes what you philosophy. Your philosophy on business. Well, I don't think I was given it for being a prominent businessman. I think I was given it for, um, you know, being uh, in terms of my legislative voting record, you know, supporting small business and um, you know the issues that they have to deal with. And I think a lot of that is based on the fact that I am a small businessman and can identify with their problems. So we're we're talking about cutting energy taxes or dealing with the minimum wage or the regulatory climate. I mean, my voting record is, is, is favored by the small business community because okay. I'm, I'm voting 
uh, on bills that they favor and against bills that they don't like. So the NFIB, National Federation of Independent Business, um, you know, then, actually this is the second time I won the award. Well, now you got to get the Business Council uh, Award. <laughs> we'll, we'll go ahead. We're running out of time. So yeah. We're running out of time. Senator, it's very good. You're uh, doing good work for the, the people of New York and upstate New York and a product to the Jewish people. And we thank you very much and wish you the best success with good health. Well, All thank you very much. Success. It was great to be thank here. You. Thank you for, for inviting me.